Welcome to another episode of Avelia Connect. Today we have with us Rodney Hayes, our CEO, and Alexandre Alves, a senior principal engineer at Amazon. And then we're going to approach something that's a big hit nowadays. So we know AI is a big thing, and Gen AI is even bigger now. But what's something that we've been seeing quite a lot is not everybody that actually invests or is in the field of AI knows what that means. So today we're actually going to bring some news cases and, and shed some light on important concepts and cases. So you guys, if you could introduce yourselves, I mean, we can start by alphabetic order. So Alex, if you can do it, that'd be great. Yeah, I always go first because of that. All right. So my name, my name is Alex. Um, I'm a senior principal engineer at Amazon. Uh, right now working on Amazon Health Services. Um, which is kind of a new organization, somewhat new organization. I've been with Amazon for 10 years, uh, done a lot of AI, machine learning optimization problems, uh, in supply chain, grocery, and, and so on. Prior to that, uh, I worked in a bunch of different companies in the Bay Area, um, and I've been kind of outside of Brazil for, I don't know, 20, 25 years now. I'm originally from Brazil, like uh, my friend here, Horton. I don't have that kind of love. I think we're all, all immigrants. So, so I mean, Alex is a, it's like a close friend. He's been uh, a mentor as well. He you know, started the, the company Avalia, and he was, uh, he was guide, guiding a lot of the thinking. So it's, it's really you know, an honor or pleasure to be more friends. And you know, he's one of these guys that it's really, I have the curve and seen everything when it comes to machine learning, uh, way before machine, machine learning was the hot topic of the day, right? And I think, you know, we do a lot of work with uh, boards and uh, private equity teams, uh, m and teams, uh, acquiring and investing in businesses. And everyone now is throwing, uh, you know, Gen AI or machine learning into their pitches into the future. And I think it's from a business perspective, it's good to bring some of this vocabulary and to understand how things apply and what in reality works and separate a bit from the hype. And, you know, Alex, you've got a great experience in the field. And I think, you know, we could start discussing like users of Gen AI in the, in the wild. You know? How, how are people how are people using this? And you know, we, we we hear guys like Elon Musk worried about the future of humanity and gen, you know a super AI that, that could you know take over everything. But the reality is very far from that. So so what do you see uh, that's being used and you know that's interesting to look at that's real not high. Right now, thanks. Well, first of all, I'm very glad to be here, and it's always great to talk to you, um, um, and, and Camila here. Yeah, and I, you're right. There's a there's a tendency of think of thinking of these new solutions, technologies as silver bullet, right? But I think, as you said, it's important to to not to do that, not to consider it as a black box, but really understand what's happening. In fact, um, you know, AI and machine learning. In my view, it is no different. When you're developing a machine learning application, it's no different than developing any kind of engineering product. It's an engineering process you go through, right? That involves some science experimentation, but at the end of the day, it's an engineering process, right? So the, the same, you know, the, the same mindset and techniques and processes that we all have already for developing solutions applies to machine learning. So we started with that, um, and, uh, and uh, like I said, it's also very important to start off from, uh, you know, thinking about what problem you're solving before jumping into how to solve it. Uh, often, us as engineers, we like to do the other way around, right? Let's pick the nice tech, we use that, and then let's find a problem. But then no, no, it doesn't doesn't work like that. Um, like you pointed out. Um, you know, Gen AI is a new thing, but AI has been happening for a while, right? Um, 
In fact, I think I've been applying machine learning AI for at least some 10 years now. Okay. It's a long time. Yeah, um, I, think it, I think when you talk about the uh, same processes uh, of engineering, I think it's really interesting because, you know, Agile has become very big. And the point of Agile development is to have small incremental improvements and quick feedback so you can adjust how you develop products and how you do things. And, you know, it makes me think of a, of a case uh, I saw the other day where this company was using Gen AI to revamp their marketing. So they had all these articles that were pure text, but uh, marketing ranks better if you have images. So they took the text, they put on AI to summarize the text, so get the main point of the whole text, and then fed the main point to an image generation uh, AI that brought back a picture that was kind of relevant, related with the content, and one for every post. You know, not all the posts got a good image, but Good, I think 60% of the posts got uh, custom images. And then they brought the marketing material back and kind of revamped uh, that thing. So it, it's not disruptive, you know, but it's uh, an iterative process where, you know, it's really agile, right? You try with one, you see if the image is good, it looks good, so you try with more. Then you see there's a try and error, not all work, and you're building a marketing uh, process that's integrating uh, AI to to help you build content, right, and sell more and drive more interest, which may may bring the opposite, which is like there's too much content coming out <laughs> with the artificial content. Uh, but but yeah. would you say that this process applies to other areas? And, and, and sorry, other applications. Camille, you want to make a point yeah, before? I was to ask something that's similar to what Rodney kind of asked. I was, say, I was going to say, do you think it's fair to say nowadays that all this uh, this marketing case or use case, and then when we think about um, the allegation as well that perhaps, you know, what Elon Musk is saying that AI is going to dominate the world, you know, we're going to be out of jobs and a, a bit of more dramatic um, statement. Do you think that AI nowadays is being used more when it comes to automating human processes and the human element is still very important for the inputs and outputs that actually are coming validating, but also making sure that you know what you're doing when you're, you know, pressing an input and using AI on a day-to-day -day basis. And also, l let me unpack this a little bit. So, uh, you know, three very good questions, right? So first one is, um, um, yeah, you know, how does engineering process apply to AI? Mm -hmm. And then... The second point you made, uh, Rodney, of, um, you know, he's a, he's a simple example in marketing. And uh, let's talk about that as well. Um, but, uh, you know, what are the good examples? And, and then your final point, Camila, on, you know, how much of automation, let's talk about automation and human, autom you know, and automation uh, in terms of how it relates to human labor, right? Uh, so let, let's start with the second one, actually. Okay. which is the use case, the marketing use case. I think that's a great use case because uh, I think one, one issue or one, uh, one trend that we all have is to start trying to solve or applying technology with the perhaps the more complicated or, you know, the more evolved uh, problem. So, for example, people are trying to using, uh, to use generative AI or AI in general on the critical path when they are serving a customer on the website. That's actually quite complicated. But if you take a step back, like you, you were saying, Rodney, the, uh, you could also use AI kind of in a kind of an offline mode where you're not serving the customer uh, immediately, but you're generating content or products or some artifact that then helps serve the customer. That offline side is easier to start with because, of course, you, you can supervise what's happening. Um, it, it, you know, you can learn through that process, which is essentially engineering, you know, methodology. Do it, 
look at it, learn, improve, do it again. Right? And, and I think it gives you a chance to differentiate as well, right? Because if you if you just have something standard and you're trying to do it on the fly, uh, first, maybe yeah. the accuracy isn't that good. Second, you probably rely a lot on the more generic part and you don't have that much tuning. I don't know. It's probably harder. Exactly. Exactly. So, so I think that the, the, the first point is, as you do it and you're learning, I think be focused on what is your goal. And in the, on the marketing, right, essentially your goal was to drive your, you know, eyeballs, so to drive, you know, traffic. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that mental model, okay, my goal is to drive traffic. What is the best content that will do that? Uh, you know, that, then you apply AI to automate the generation of that content. Gen AI is actually we, that's a really nice scenario for Gen AI. You get the content, you can look at it, and you can change your process to improve that. Now, you know, as as, as you know, as this kind of points out, you have to have a human in the loop. Right? you still need an expert. So, so the question of automation. I, I think really the, the other way to look at this is uh, you're automating the pieces that can be automated so that you as an expert, as a human, can do more of your mm -hmm. work and focus on the things that are higher end and more important. So this, I do think it's about uh, empowering people rather than... Uh, replacing. Replacing. Right. But, that, but that's a good point because now you're talking about the okay, information of certain jobs and in the process we're creating new jobs. Yeah. And you know, we hear a lot of uh, a lot of companies thinking, okay, especially now in the current economic situation, a lot of companies saying, okay, how can we reduce costs? How can we invest less? But if you're going to bring a new technology on board, you have a learning curve, uh, you have trial and error. And and then finally common mistake I see is that people think that, oh, we've built the software, now it's done, we just need to maintain it. Uh, yeah. But in reality, you know, you, you'd be spending, you know, 20, 25% of the cost to build just to keep it up to date, just to maintain it. And yeah. then if the software is used, uh, you have to invest more to keep it relevant, so to create new features. Yeah, and now you plug a different kind of software engineering on top, where you're doing the same. So you have the classic software engineer, now you have machine learning, and you know there's an investment there. And by the time you think, oh, I'm going to be saving all this money, perhaps there'll be so much demand that the business case is really on the upside. And people looking at the saving costs in the short term might have very simple they can do and, and so, so it'd be interesting also to understand like if you build a, uh, a machine learning team that's building an application for machine learning what kind of roles and profiles and tooling is it the same as software engineering a scrum master developers QA uh, a product owner or is it different yeah, the analysts that's engineer. Yeah. I think maybe I, I like maybe one step back is it is it, I mean, question maybe number zero, is it for someone who's uh, like me, like a dummy in technology or in software engineering, because I'm not a software engineer. Um, is it that when I look at companies that want to implement AI, do they need to have two different software development teams? One dedicated for machine learning and one dedicated for the current, for example, the current platform that they have? Or is it that it could be one team and then they just have different tasks? I think that then I think Rodney's question follows us like specific roles right. and how that fall into your team building it. Yeah, no, that, that, those are great questions. And uh, yeah, and you're right. People tend to ignore the the team aspect of it and the human aspect of it, which is actually more important than you know, often that one project that you're working on, right? But, uh, let, but uh, before, I, I guess to answer that, let's actually walk through the process of development. Right. Maybe that's the easiest way of doing this, right? Okay. So, so, so we we started this scenario where um, we're generating, improving our marketing content. So, let's say we're coming up with a 
a, a, a team to solve that problem, improving marketing content, right? So like like in a neo regular dev uh, process, right? First thing you do is you form a team. You, you want to keep it small and keep it uh, agile, right? You establish your goal. I think the goal is the same. You just have one of the essentially your goal, your business goal is to improve traffic and do it quicker, right? So 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 the first question then is, what's your baseline? Well, okay, my baseline is. Uh, today it takes me three months, and the the content is generate generate you know um, you know cost, has X amount of traffic daily you know let's say a thousand uh, yeah, daily traffic yeah. yeah hits a day right so that's my baseline okay and it, it and by the way establish your baseline is probably one of the best thing you do and often not done yeah hundred percent right. right. Now, okay, so with that in mind, you, you set up your team. Um, so, so to do this, the first, so you, you know, as you know, you come up with your, um, set up your code repository, you know, set up your development tools, all that stuff, right? Now, one thing that you also have to do is to get the data that you're going to use to drive the uh, the generation of the new content, right? So, so essentially, if you look at a, a, a take a step back, the the process of achieving those goals, uh, really of generating content, is really to learn from all the content that already exists and generate new content that follows the pattern of, other con of the original content you have, right? Yeah. So. AI really is, or uh, really machine learning to be a little bit more precise, is the process of getting a lot of observations and from those observations, generating a, uh, or what we say, inducing a model that is able to uh, generalize what you have seen. That's what it's doing, generalizing what it has seen. Right. So, I, but I think I think we should unpack the word model, because you know everybody talks about the machine learning model. What is the model? Right, that, that's a good point. So, a uh, and and there we have a uh, we have models everywhere, right? So we have a model of uh, how to develop software. We have uh, you know architectural models. A machine learning model um, is uh, simply a, a set of um, uh, it, it is a a uh, let me so the different ways of the different types of models, but I think in the simplest definition, a a, a machine learning model is a component that is able to generalize data. Right, that component in most cases is a description of the process for doing that together with parameters that specify how to do it, right? So for example, uh, if my model, I'm trying to uh, infer the price of an apartment, given the size of the apartment, you know, the location of the apartment, right? So my problem is, you know, infer or predict the price of an apartment, right? And my input data for doing that is, you know, size, location, Historical prices, maybe. No, you need exactly. to have like a number of data points. Yeah, yeah the, the the price of my neighborhood uh, mm -hmm. apartments, right? Um, I will. Uh, so, so I have some data that describes, you know, the the the, the this, these observations of what is the price given these inputs we mentioned. Okay. Right? So that so I'm going to now apply a simple model, which is a linear model. And I'm, I'm going to assume that the price is somewhat literally uh, correlated to these inputs I mentioned, right? The, the, the apartment size and the, uh, and the, and the location. Mm -hmm. So, so, so let, me, let, me, let me just try to paraphrase this in a simple way. Yeah. So I have a table with a list of apartment, location, size, and price. So it's like an Excel table. 
And yeah. then I give an assumption, the model is describing, okay, look, assume that if the surface of the apartment goes up, the price of the apartment also goes up in some sort of linear correlation. So yeah. X equal A times Y. So, so it's a very linear rather than an exponential where, you know, if, yeah. if the surface increases 10%, the price gets 50%. I don't know. The surface increases 10%, the price increases 10% or 15%, but on the same exactly. rate. So that's yeah. the description of the model. It's the formula. So when I get exactly. a bigger, y goes with it uh, in a certain linear correlation, or um, in a Gaussian distribution, right? Well, or exponential, exponential, that kind of stuff, right? But are the, right. then those are the parameters that you establish when you're building a model. Yeah. So so the, okay. so the so the description so the model like. Uh, that that is exactly the way you're modeling your cost of modeling. That's a, you see, we use the word model everywhere, but that's yeah. exactly the way you'll think about a problem. If you have a spreadsheet, the rows are your observations, the columns are really, uh, you know, the fields that describe those observations, like the size of the apartment, the location, neighborhood, mm -hmm. right? Those features, no, in, in machine, mm -hmm. the features. We call that in machine learning, we call those features, right? Which is confusing for software engineers because features means something else. But yeah, those yeah. are features. Or in mathematics, right? We often call it as our independent variable because they're going to be what it's used to create your dependent variable, which is the prediction. Right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But we the can. model then becomes, uh, you know, the assumption of, uh, how I'm gonna, uh, or, or really, the model becomes, uh, you have to make a decision on how do you wanna formulate, it's really a description of what do you do to learn the parameters that help you predict, right? So, okay. This is the question of putting the data that you give them. Yeah. Is it to, to, yeah, to explain the example, which is the model really then becomes, in this case, the fact that I chose a linear equation uh -huh. and the parameters that I learned by looking at the data that I just associated with the linear equation. Ah, uh, right. Okay. Well, my model essentially is, you know, 2x plus 3, you know, 2x1 plus 3x2, where x1 is, you know, the apartment size, x2 is the apartment location, right? And the parameters the two and a plus three, so the two and three are the parameters, right? Okay. And, okay. and the then point here, the, though, the machine yeah. learning discovers with all the scattered plots what's that line, assuming it's a linear line, and gives you that inclination. So machine learning is looking at all these observations, kind of plotting, and then finding, okay, is it like this or like that? Before, and then and that creates this model that is it's wrong because it probably doesn't fit exactly all the observations, but yes. it's useful because it gets close to it. The problem that we have in mathematics of any correlation, right? Uh, because in a way, you, I mean, it could it could make wrong correlations based on the data that you provide. But is it because I think another question that business people usually when they're analyzing a pitch or when they're listening to someone pitching an AI is uh, the sample the data, the sample that is then used on those models. Is it that to have then like in any mathemat mathematic um, problem that the bigger the sample, the more assertive you are based on the parameters that you actually give? Yeah, that, that's a very deep question actually. And it's a deep oh, answer. No. Yeah, but um, let me, let, 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 just to tie out these things and I'll answer that, right? So okay. we start off discussing what is that you do in machine learning? Well, what is it that uh, an AI application, developing AI application means, right? And we yeah. said, well, first thing is, so you create some set up your thing as usual. Um, uh, the next thing is, well, there's some, uh, what exactly you're trying to do? So establish your baseline, establish your, uh, your new objective. Now, um, as you do your usual process of software engineering, you have just one new dimension, which is you're trying to automate 
uh, well, really before you get into automation, you really try to learn from the data you already have to be able to predict, to help you uh, automate something, right? Okay. That process of learning really is looking at those samples and then uh, uh, making an assumption of how the problem looks like. So we made an assumption that likely the size of the apartment grows, the price will likely go as well. So there's a, there's mm -hmm. a assumption of the linearity between your parameters or independent variables and your target or dependent variable. That's an assumption we made. Right? Yeah. It, and that's why we call this in, in inducing something because you're starting from samples that are not complete. Mm. And you you created a bias. This is an important point. We it's one of the big things in AI, isn't it? Like biased AI. It's one of the big Exactly. I mean, but because we a, bias, a simple bias saying we assume that this is, there's this linear relationship, right? And yeah. that's fine. Right, we will, we will can we can determine if the buy is right or wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Now, as we look at the data, we learn that the the parameterization of that uh, linear equation, so the model ends up being the fact that it's a linear equation that follows x plus y plus z, and the parameter that goes in front of it. So you know, a alpha, uh, alpha one, uh, you know, alpha two, and so on, which is like if the price goes up. Uh, the apartment doubles in size, the price will also double in size. Let's or double in value, right? That's yeah. so it's a true, right? That's mm -hmm. the problem. Mm -hmm. That's your model. Now, um, let's go back to so first. So what what's next? Okay, so what's next is well, we start with all these samples. So how do we get the samples? All right. So the so the one additional dimension you have for your software engineering process when you talk about machine learning, is that you actually have a lot of data that you have to look at that now has become part of solving your problem. Okay. So before, you, you kind of, when you were solving a solving any problem, you created a code and you, uh, your dependencies was likely another set of codes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You created an additional dependency. Your code now, your application that depends not only on the code you created, but, but also on the data you have. Mm. Which means that to to Rodney's point, you know, anytime log for the, the log for J changes or what any other library dependence dependent library, we update our code. But now you also have to update your solution because your data changed. Oh, it's right. Something easy to see. Yeah. Right? Okay. So, so I think the term I use is is like a non-stationary maintenance link. And what could be a good example of like data changing? For example, let's think about something that for well, the war, right? So the war now is a new factor, and then you have then to input that on your data, and then automatically then it, it you're assuming that you need to update your software as well. So the new version coming in that you will know, then tax that as well, or or is that is that is that a correct assumption? Or yeah, so, so, uh, the, the, several things can cause the data to change, right? COVID can happen, and all okay. the data for kind of useless. Yeah, stuff happening, you know, uh, which was a great thing. Yeah, but it, it changed the world, so the data changed. Okay, right? okay. So, so, uh, yeah, go ahead. All right, look, sorry. Just, just go see what you're the model, right? So you have the samples. You throw uh, an assumption, which is your bias, that there is a linear correlation between the columns of the table, like the size of the apartment and the price. So mm -hmm. you throw that that's your bias. Then uh, machine learning calculates several options of correlation and defines oh, the best fit for the sample is this angle. So for every one meter or every one percent to grow the apartment, uh, the price goes 0 0.9. So it's not exactly yeah. one to one, it's a little bit yeah. And it's just covered by trying many options and finding the resulting yeah. model is the formula that says, okay, 0 0.9 is the parameter that connects the feature size with the feature price. So you don't when you deliver, you don't deliver the table with all the prices. 
you just deliver the formula with these parameters that make the calculation. Uh, that's that a very good point. point. Yeah, yeah, no, right? that's, yeah. That's, that's right. That's exactly right. That's a very good point. Yeah, the, the model becomes the formula with the parameters. You don't actually need the data anymore. You summarize the data. So summarization effort, you summarize the data through a formula and its parameters. And that's also- So it's a compression mechanism, right? Because I saw yeah. a paper that they, they use the same models to do image compression and sound compression. And these yeah. machine learning models actually perform better than like JPEG and, and other yeah. uh, sound compression mechanisms because it, it's exact, exactly doing that, right? It's figuring out for every sample, uh, yeah. you know, what's the, uh, what's the, yeah. Yeah, it's exactly yeah. It's exactly that. You are you are compressing, and in fact, that's where the term embedding. I'm sure you guys have heard the term embedding. Um, At some point, I think in life, they might have somebody mentioned embedding. It could be a blog that they had when they were 15, or you know, you name it. But it was a thing. Yeah, but I think now with deep learning and you know, foundational models, LLMs, you know, a big piece of that is. People say, you know, is my embedding. No, what does that really mean? Is exactly what I think you said, Rodney, which is we started off in this bigger space, right? You had a bunch of data. It's, you know, a bunch of columns. You compress to this smaller space. So you embedded the bigger space into a smaller space. Right. And that's it. So you put it on embedding, right? But in, um, but yeah, essentially, yeah, it's a compression, it's a summarization, it's a, and I think what's important to realize is it's also what we call a few poison problem. Okay. Which means there is That's no new. best model. Yeah. You cannot determine the best model given the data you have, right? Okay. They, huh. It's not enough. You yeah. can probably come up with another model, then it's going to be better. When you see different data, like you don't have enough information to come with the absolute best part. And that's actually your point, Avery, because I do think that so new AI solutions are coming now. Do you think that the guys that don't have a lot of data to, you know, put it in the model, they might suffer from that? That, you know, you might have similar solutions that come into different conclusions because of the samples that they use. And yeah. the maybe the quality of the data as well that they use. Yeah, exactly. So I, I think back to your... I think last question, which is, um, you know, do you need always more sample? Does it, how does the number of samples relate to the end result, mm. right? Mm. And yeah, that's actually a very tricky question because um, uh, generally, the more that you have, the better, okay. right? So yeah. we do need more data to be able to, you know, summarize and find those patterns, right? The and as the data changes, you have to, you know, retrain or redo something, which, you know, back to the maintenance point, becomes much more complicated because it's not just yeah. hard dependence, kind of soft dependencies, well, implicit dependencies, which are, you know, hard to manage. However, if you have too much data, more data than you have parameters, mm -hmm. then it's learning, you're just caching. Become a cat, you have a map, right? Like, uh, you know, Rod and I went to computer science. One of the first things we learned was cash, right? You, you, you know, you, everything you, you put on a map, you map A to B, it's always, you map, you know, it's always A to B, you know, B to C, it's, it's all one to one. It's a, like a very, um, you know, often a bijective function. You always go from one to here, here, back, right? The, well, just cash. So if you have, you give it too much data, you may end up just putting in a cache. So mm -hmm. what new data you see, it's not able to generalize anymore. So that's a you job. have too much weight, weight for one direction. And then a small yeah. sample doesn't doesn't affect the, the, the inclination of the curve that you plotted with the other samples because you repeated too much of the same characteristic, right? Mm. Yeah. That's yeah. Pretty and, pretty yeah, it's interesting to think about that data could also damage the model then, in a way. The amount yeah, of bias is the model, yeah. yeah. The bias is the model. So, so if you, if, like the, the classic story is uh, 
on recognizing faces and like engineers in Silicon Valley, and they're all, you know, of a certain demographic, or, you know, the majority have a certain demographic, and then you have difficulty uh, recognizing faces in different demographics, right? Because yeah. you, you sampled uh, too much, it's, it's a generalization. Uh, Process, right? You generalize from what you see. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, so, so, sorry. I think I think we we wanted to get into the um, Gen AI piece, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Gen AI. So, so we, we we started with saying, okay, look, we want to have AI. We have to have the competency not only to do software engineering, but to do uh, AI engineering. Oh, and yeah. a part of the AI engineering is uh, you know, having a baseline to know if anything is getting better, otherwise you're optimizing or not, you don't even know. Mm. Then the second thing is you need data of good quality and good distribution. So mm -hmm. the sample can't be too biased, otherwise you predict to see what you already see. You just yeah. repeat that the caching mechanism, so you, you overload to a certain pattern and you can keep repeating that pattern. Yeah. Uh, and then the next point is, okay, so there is a process where we take all this data, we find the parameters, which are the, the numbers that determine the curves that will predict when size of the flat changes, the price changes, the location changes, the price changes, and vice versa, right? Uh, but, but then this is kind of rigid. You have that model, you test it on that, uh, data sample, and you meet a new sample. Mm -hmm. You meet new cases, and you yeah. throw these cases against this model, but they are not part of the model. The model was not trained on this data. This is new data. Right. And over time, what you're saying is that, okay, the, the model you have, the reality might move on. So there's a kind of drift between what you expect and what you encounter. So from time to time, you kind of like have to rebase and yeah. you know kind of get them close to reality again. So I don't know, traffic, pre-COVID, and you had a certain expectation, COVID happened, it changed, you adjust, then post-COVID it changed again, and you have to adjust again. And if you just stay static, uh, there is kind of like a shelf life to that mm, data, yeah. right? It's only valid mm. for so long and then it kind of dies mm. out. And this maintenance is investment on top. So the same way you have to invest to maintain a software running and invest more to maintain the software useful by adding features, uh, you now have to maintain your model, your data, and you probably have to also enhance the quality of the data, the features, and that's that's just more work, right? I think exactly. for you, Ronnie, and then that Alex, I think you can uh, maybe try try to bring the technical side of things, but because we do work a lot with the buy side, right, or internal stuff of the companies, and and do you think that they factored that in when they decide to implement AI, the maintenance or low? And then mm -hmm. having to kind of like having this layer of complexity on top of what they have built over time, because it, it, it almost seems like it compounds, like it almost seems like it's compound interest over whatever it is that they have projected in terms of cost or even team, I would say like either to maintain that or to build on top of that and keep that updated. Yeah, no, it, it's not an obvious problem. So people tend, when they first start, they tend not to do this, right? Which is... Uh, right. That, Right. So, so, and, and this is very interesting, right? Because if you th think about, you know, when I started developing, you know, you develop a software, let's say a transactional system that's doing bank banking. Mm -hmm. That's something can go forever. Like your banking rules change, you go there and play your bank rules. But otherwise, you, the life, like the word you use, the, the shelf life is like really forever. Yeah. Right? Yeah. This is very different. This, this application mm -hmm. that you developed whose shelf life depends on, you know, data that is moving constantly, as well as assumptions that you made internally or implicit as you develop, right? So, 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 and it's just important to distinguish this, there's data drift, 
for the data you receive is drifting and that they used to train. Okay. And this model drift, like where the assumption you made, you know, things were linear. Like every the, the number of people that are working from home was, you know, 10%. And then suddenly, you know, it's 100%. So it broke your assumption. It broke your formulation. Right. 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 So yeah. What happened? Now, Ooh. at the end of the day, though, it's a, it, it is a engineering process of establishing what is that you're optimizing, your goal, establishing where you where you started, your baseline, and tracking, you know, progression towards the goal, progression of, you know, uh, you know, going down from the, or leading the goal, right? Okay. So, then, so having the business goal, what I'm trying to do, or, you know, the strategic goal, which is not a business, but, you know, yeah. what I want to achieve, what's my state today, and am I moving in the right direction or not? Right. So it's a track, a constant tracking process in a way for the model and for the data. That's the that's the biggest. And the thing results, right? Yeah, and the results, yeah. yeah, and the results, yeah. So then you have like yeah. three then new layers, almost yeah. to whatever you build. And, you yeah, and, and Camila, to, to your point, like, so okay, so people will let's say okay, I got it. I'll start tracking my results. Right. So the first thing yeah. they do, or I did, for example, was okay, what results should I track? Okay, let me track the ac accuracy of the model or, you know, the precision, the recall, right? Things that are related to how well my model does in terms of predicting your value. Okay. But that's not, that, that's your unit test, right? Your system test is actually that you have to tie back to a business metric, right? Did it drive the traffic that I expected? Did it decrease the amount of time it took me to generate the content? Because right. the function yeah. that your model getting better means your business metric getting better is actually another thing. Mm -hmm. and, and just to be clear, unit testing software is like you do a small algorithm and you want to make sure that this algorithm continues to work uh, if you change things. So okay. you do a CPF or, or uh, social security uh, validation automatically. And it is something changed and you change that algorithm, but you, you, you do a check to make sure that works. That's a unit test. But okay. you might have a system test, which is, oh, I want to register uh, in a website and it has to check my social security, but also the my picture, it's on the data, and you want to navigate through the whole thing that do the system test and make sure you might have, it still work, but now, you know, it returns slightly different or, or it has a different behavior that breaks the system. So you have to check at both levels, the unit okay. and, and the system, right? And in machine learning, you start having the same kind of uh, situation. You have very local problems to solve and you mm -hmm. have more broader business uh, questions you're trying to solve and yeah. you're trying to look for. Look, I think, uh, I think what we do now is uh, we have a lot to talk. And we get on the part two of the <laughs> series. Yeah, because I think one point there, Craig, because we've had, I mean, for listeners, I think this is quite interesting because it goes into the depth of what is AI, because I think it demystifies a little bit of AI in a, in a sense, and then AI and AI are kind of the thing. But it's interesting to get to understand a bit more about the use cases and the reality that how does that apply? Because maybe, you know, some of, some of you who are listening are thinking about using or implementing AI in your businesses. But it's quite harsh from, uh, I, I think even like from a financial perspective, it's a bit hard to have the visibility of, you know, the compound work, the investment over time from a people process and, you know, product perspective as well, um, as well as the investment in a way that needs to be factoring to make sure that you, you keep everything updated. Because I mean, that's the, I guess that's the risk, right? Is that you have a now data model, all data data, and then you just pretty much it become an innovative yeah. company in a way. Yeah. Um, but there are also so many other things that we spoke about, even the offline and online uh, situation, uh, which I think is quite interesting. And then I do feel like there are more interesting uh, things that even bias is a whole another episode, bias in AI, which I think is something that could be, you know, it's fascinating to see how deep you can go. And obviously I have two people here that are experts that can deep down um, into this, but um, I guess for the final, 
let's say 10 minutes, what I would like you to, to perhaps reflect on is give an advice or what would you have done differently if you were building an AI solution now or implementing AI in your current solution as a business owner or someone who worked in a, in a business um, today? Yeah. Good. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Thanks for bringing us back. Uh, I think Roddy and I could go forever on this topic, right? But uh, It's an interesting topic in your defense. I think it's something that everybody's very intrigued. And let me try to link here also back to the Gen AI question where we started. Why? Okay. And I'll give a, a, a simplifier. I'll propose a simplifier for us here, right? Which is, now if you think about AI, we talk is mapping puts to outputs. Just so that outputs are kind of almost like a summary of your inputs or something you learn from inputs, right? That's AI. Uh, we started off AI doing very simple models. We talk, we talk about linear model, where it's just have a little a few inputs, one output. Deeper learning came over, came back, and we changed from few inputs to thousands and millions of inputs to a single output. Right? So you moved from you know simpler models, not a lot of data, to a lot of data. So you have you look at samples that I need. You, you know, I have had models that really had more than 10,000 features. You know, think about 10,000 features, right? It's columns. Like that. 10,000 yeah. columns in your spreadsheet. 10,000 right? columns. Like, like, it's mind-boggling, mind right? But yeah. that, that deep learning is a lot of inputs, but you still have generally one output. Yeah. Gen generative AI is a lot of it. And a lot of output. And I think that's what's better than yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Drop the mic. Again, <laughs> okay, that's great. So so we continue that on the, the, the second episode. Thank you so much, Alex. Uh, thanks for your for uh, Mediating. Be, being you mm -hmm. while you're listening and then don't know much. <laughs> don't know a lot. Uh, so I invite you all to actually watch our episodes. And then if you're watching this on YouTube or any other platform, make sure that they send comments or one of the things they want to know about AI, because, you know, we have people here that might be able to help you and navigate through potentially hurdles that you're facing in your business or your investment team. If you want to know and invest your money and know where you're putting the money into, this is one of the best things to do. Um, a bit of us. So Avail is actually a tech advisory firm. We do run tech due diligence um, project for your investments or for perhaps even yourself, if you want to know a little bit about what's happening in house and, you know, in the kitchen and then make sure that you're planning whatever is coming ahead. That could even be implementing AI solutions and making sure that you have a clear roadmap. So don't um, hesitate to actually reach out to us and our team of experts. We're here to help you. Thank you guys so much. And thank you, Alex, again. Thanks, and Thanks for, for having me. It was a pleasure. Bye-bye.